Hey guys, what is up and welcome back to Fireside Farms. For those of you new here, my name is Megan and let me just give you a little background. I live on a 1.5 acre homestead in Southwest New Mexico, zone 8A. And today is March 16th. And March is when I start all of my root sensitive seedlings. So today I wanted to talk to y'all about root sensitive seedlings, what they are, which kinds of plants they are and why, what to do about it. So here in front of me, I have a bunch of seedlings that I did not start when I started my other vegetables like tomatoes and peppers. Now root sensitive plant varieties are those that obviously do not like their roots disturbed, which means that the way I start peppers and tomatoes is that I, trans I end up up potting them multiple times until the last frost and then I can put them out in the garden. With root sensitive plants, you do not want to be transplanting them multiple times, up potting them multiple times. In fact, it's most desirable not to have to transplant them at all, but there is a workaround. So for those that start their seeds indoors, which isn't, is completely not necessary if you have a long growing season. I prefer to do it just because I get food faster and I can, and I love watching my little seedlings inside. Um, but you can absolutely just direct sow in the garden after the last frost has passed. But there are two reasons to not start seeds indoors. One of them is that these seeds, some seeds grow very quickly, some flower varieties grow very quickly, and if you start them six weeks before your last frost, uh, they may be way too big to be in a pot, uh, they may get root bound, and it's just either not desirable to start them at all indoors or start them very close to your last frost, like one to two weeks before. Another reason is root disturbance. There are certain types of plants that do not like to be root bound, they don't like their roots messed with, and they definitely do not like being transplanted. Uh, the most, most of these varieties are going to be curcubits, so cucumbers, squash, melon varieties, and there are others, I'm, oh well, beans and peas are also in that category, though I've found them to be a little bit more forgiving. Um, there are tons of vegetables and plants that don't like root disturbance. You just kind of have to experiment with the amount of root disturbance they'll take before they kick the bucket. Um, but I'm just talking about what I grow here on my property, only the things that I have experience with. So a big flower that I grow is sunflowers. And sunflowers have long tap roots, eventually, when they grow up tall. But as a baby, they still send a long, long feeder root down. And so they are also sensitive to root disturbance. You don't want to disturb that tap root. But there is absolutely a way to start these indoors and keep them healthy and viable. And that's what we're going to go over today. So there are a couple ways to handle plants with sensitive roots. The first and foremost way is to sow them directly in the garden. That way you're not having to transplant them and worry about their roots. Unfortunately for some people, especially in the north with very short growing seasons, like a little over 100 days, that may not be possible because a lot of these varieties may take longer than 100 days to reach maturity. So you need to start early and start your plants indoors to be able to harvest them, grow them to completion. But if you have a longer growing season and you're able to sow these plants, these seeds outdoors, then that's definitely one option. Another option which I don't use because I've had difficulty with them in the past are to use biodegradable pots, such as these peat pots you can find at any big box store. You can also experiment with like toilet paper rolls, filling these with sand. These do well for plants with tap roots because it just leaves the bottom open. You stand them up like that and here's your little pot and it's biodegradable. Um, there's also like these biodegradable mesh pots. I, I've never used those. The issue I have with peat pots um, is their tendency to actually not break down. And if they don't, they're actually just, they're just constricting the plant within the soil that you put them in, within the garden. Um, and this can be a lot more prominent in desert environments like mine where it's really dry, especially if that top rim of the peat pot is exposed to air, then it just, it just dries and hardens to a crisp and you basically just planted 
a plastic pot inside the ground and expected the, the plant's roots to get through. So I don't, I don't, I've tried biodegradable pots. They're a hit or a miss. I don't love them, but they are an option, especially for those who live in wetter climates. I'm sure it's a bit easier to break those down. And a third way is to like transplant early. So what I'm doing essentially is just starting these seeds a couple weeks before my last frost. My estimated last frost is between April 1st and April 15th. Somewhere in the 1st of April, I should have my last frost. Today is March 16th. So I'm two to three weeks away from my last frost. And that's not going to give these seeds enough time to grow really large. So the plants will come up, they'll probably get their first or second set of true leaves, but within two, three weeks time, they won't become large enough where their roots are actually growing very large and starting to twirl or anything like that. So if you want to grow these root sensitive crops, start them indoors. It's best to just start them later than you start all of your other seeds, just a couple weeks before your last frost, enough to get them a head start and then transplant them out as soon as that, that last frost comes in. They have to be hardened off, of course, which I went over in my last video if you're unfamiliar with that. But then transplant them out and you don't have to worry about it. So when you unpot these plants, you shouldn't see any roots coming out of the bottom or any, definitely not any roots um, twirling around. If they got root bound, that's no good. But it's not, it's, and it's not necessarily that these plants will die. I have definitely transplanted root bound plants like melons and squash that don't like their roots disturbed especially to be root bound and they they still live they just may be stunted they may not produce very well over the course of the season they may flat out die it depends on the amount of disturbance and how tolerant that plant is to the disturbance because they're all different and a fourth way is to use soil blocks which i'll be doing in another video because i don't need this video to be like 45 minutes long um, but soil blocks are a seed starting method in which you don't use a pot uh, it's just literally a compressed block of soil that the seedling grows in and because the soil is surrounded by air in every direction the roots prune themselves because they will stop growing when they touch air and send shoots into the soil instead of the air. So that's another way to do it. I'm not going to speak too much on that method. I've done my research, but this is the first year that I'll be using soil blocks. So it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us. <laughs> um, but that video will be coming out shortly after this one and we'll see what happens. So what I'm gonna be doing now is going over all of the seeds that I'm starting today. I will be using the soil blocks but i will probably also start some of these in pots just because i like starting seeds <laughs> and i like starting seeds multiple ways just in case one fails so what i'm going over is a couple of herbs a couple of grains that i haven't sowed like sorghum beans cucumbers squash both summer squash and winter squash and a couple flowers such as sunflowers although i will not be um starting too many sunflowers indoors. They do really, really well for me in my sandy soil. As long as I keep them watered very well, I have no problem germinating sunflowers in my regular dirt, which is amazing. So I'm gonna continue doing that. But let's get started with this seed haul. So I'm looking at these flowers and so a lot of these flowers are not sensitive to root disturbance. I just didn't start them with my other veggies. I don't know why but I guess I'll be starting them today in pots. So the sunflowers that I have that I will not be starting except directly sown outdoors are the Else Blend sunflower, the Gold Coin sunflower, the Valentine sunflower, and the Terra Humera white seeded sunflower. I've grown all of these before. They've all done well except for the Elves Blend. It, it didn't seem to enjoy the heat as much as the larger varieties did, and they, they petered out pretty quickly, pretty early last season. So I'm, I'm gonna try them again, obviously. Until that seed pack is gone, I'm planting them. And then I have a couple, I don't grow a 
whole ton of ornamentals. First, they don't really interest me as much as actual food growing does. I like them in the garden because they're beautiful, but they also take up space where I could have planted something to eat. So I don't do a whole lot of ornamentals, but I do love zinnias and I have polar bear zinnia, it's a white variety. The envy zinnia, which is a green variety. A whirly gig mix. I've had success with this variety every year and I've saved seeds from it. And this candy cane variety. I also have two types of nasturtiums, black velvet and the fiesta blend, it's just orange. And straw flowers. Straw flowers are actually pretty common here. Um, I find them in the local gardening centers all the time. They're a heat tolerant flower, but they, they did not like me last year. I did not keep any of them alive. Next up, let's do beans, which I will, I will not be starting a ton of beans from seed indoors. I have pretty good luck germinating them outside in the raised bed garden. But I do have a couple new bean varieties that I'll be working with this year. One is this purple hole pink eye cow pea. Now a cow pea, or otherwise called a southern pea, a crowder pea, a field pea, a black eyed pea. <laughs> they're a bean, um, but they're a heat tolerant bean. They grow very well in the south. And I mean, it's any of your typical like black eyed peas, that's a, that's a southern pea, a cow pea. So I grow several varieties of cow peas just because they do better. I've had bad luck with beans that weren't heat tolerant in the past. I grew a scarlet runner bean last year that only grew to about two feet tall and sent out a couple blooms before the ambient air temperature just killed it. <laughs> And it was under my shade cloth, so I won't be growing the Scarlet Runner Bean again. But I've had awesome harvests from this California Black Eye number five and the asparagus bean. Those cow peas did very well for me, and the asparagus bean is another heat tolerant runner bean that did very well for me. It's best eaten as a green bean, not not really dried like the cow peas are. Um, I do have this contender bush bean, which is a very popular variety everywhere. <laughs> I don't have any luck with it. It prefers cooler temperatures and we don't really have a cool spring. I tried to grow a couple in the fall last year, but we also just go from summer to winter and there's not really a fall. So I haven't had great luck with <laughs> contender bush bean, but that's fine because I have the California black eye number five, which is a bush bean and extremely prolific in my heat. Another one that I might grow a couple of, I saved seeds from last year, it's the rattlesnake pole bean. It stopped producing beans during the summer months in the heat. It did make it through and then produced when we had our August and September monsoon. But, I mean, it just looked pretty for half of the season because of the heat. So, I save seeds and I will try and grow it again. But if it ends up not producing again because of the heat, I just won't grow it because it takes up an entire trellis in my garden. Next we have cucumbers and I have two varieties here that I'm unfamiliar with. They're brand new. And I bought a hybrid cucumber as well that is heat tolerant or more heat tolerant because the cucumbers tend to shrivel up or not produce at all once we hit late June and July. So I'm hoping this hybrid cucumber thunder from seeds and such does better for me than this market more cucumber did last year. This is a cucumber that I've grown the past two years and I got cucumbers off of it. It just didn't last very long. This is one I will not be growing this year. <laughs> this is the Mexican sour gherkin cucumber. It's also called a mouse melon. It was beautiful. It completely engulfed my trellis with vines that kind of look like English ivy almost, but it did not like the heat and it didn't produce me a single, single thing, single little cucumber until September, I think. 
and it just it takes over everything the, the foliage took over everything but it was too hot it was dropping blossoms and then if a, if it managed to produce a fruit the fruit shriveled up the next day it, the black it just it didn't didn't work well for me i'm not gonna grow it this year <laughs> i don't have that much trellis space until i expand the garden a little bit more and here is an armenian cucumber and i believe this is actually a melon it's just eaten like a cucumber and it's a heat tolerant variety so we are going to give this a go i think it will be successful i've heard lots of good stories about it in my area as well as on youtube and on the google machine so i'm excited for this variety as well should produce cucumbers so i can actually make pickles this year and now on to the squash i have so many squash varieties i had to use two boxes for them but most of these are brand new varieties that I'm growing for the first time this year. Eee! Okay. So first, this is not an edible squash variety. This is a gourd that's just supposed to be fun. I guess you keep it on the vine until it dries up. You let it cure for several months and once it's completely dry, you can scoop out the insides and it's hard, so you can carve it into, I guess people carve it into birdhouses. I'll put a picture up. Very cool, so I'm, I'm gonna grow these. And I'm gonna separate these into watermelon, winter squash, and summer squash. Now the difference between winter squash and summer squash is not that they're grown in the winter versus summer. It's more historically based on when they were eaten. Summer squash are gonna be your soft squashes, like your green zucchini, your yellow squash, your delicata soft squash those kinds of squashes that you can eat the outside rind of because it's still soft those are summer squashes and they do not have a long shelf life maybe max a month a couple months but they will go bad now winter squash is called winter squash because historically you would have saved it and eaten it during the winter these kinds of squashes are going to be your hard outer rind squashes like a butternut or pumpkins, seminole pumpkin, a spaghetti squash. These squashes you leave on the vine until their outer rind becomes hard and they can store for a very long time. I have a squash in here, a blue hubbard, which is supposed to actually be able to store for up to a year. And I have a lot of varieties of winter squash because I really wanted to have a good storage of food over this coming winter of things that I can actually grow. You know, besides dehydrating or freezing meat or canning food, this is a great whole food that you can just put in a closet and forget about for a couple months. So I've got a lot of varieties of winter squash as well. And I've got, only got a couple varieties of watermelon. I like watermelon. It's not that I don't like watermelon. They just take up a lot of space and they're a fun treat. It's not something I can make a meal out of. So I've got a couple kinds. I don't have great luck with them except for one of these varieties, which we'll get to. But I'm still trying to amend my in-ground soil to make it more tasty <laughs> for plants. And so a lot of my past failures of squash and watermelon have been because I tend to plant them out in the in-ground garden which still isn't at 100% good soil. So we'll keep going with the winter squash. I just went over the gourd. And then I have this blue Hubbard, which is so neat looking. This is so cool. I don't know anything about it. I've never grown it. I'm sorry, guys. We have the honey nut squash. This is a mini butternut variety. It only gets to like four to five inches long. It's so adorable. They, they sell them in stores. Um, but this is cute. <laughs> also, I'm growing this, which is not edible. You don't want to eat this, but I'm sure you've seen natural loofahs in the store. If you didn't know it came from plants, that's where it comes from. <laughs> so I'm gonna grow a couple of these and they're supposed to be pretty heat tolerant. We'll see how it goes. I planted them out last year, but it was in the in-ground garden and they did not do very well. We'll be, we'll be trying that again. This is a new variety to me as well. It's called the Tahitian melon, and it's apparently a butternut type. It's, it's got an orange flesh like a butternut. It's a cornucopia gourd mix. 
You do not want to eat these. In fact, a lot of gourd mixes like this can have toxic, like you, you, like you shouldn't eat them, they're toxic. This is just for fun. I like fall gourd decorations. And gourds are so expensive. For what they are, it's ridiculous trying to buy gourds at the store. So I'm just gonna grow my own fall decorations this year. This is a seminal pumpkin. I have not grown this variety before, but I've heard good things from other gardeners on YouTube, specifically David the Goods channel, about how heat tolerant they are and how well they did in his poor sandy soil. I also have poor sandy soil, though the video he did and he was living in subtropical climate and I'm living in the desert. I'm hoping there's some overlap there. <laughs> and then the last one is just your standard spaghetti squash. And that's it for the winter squash I will be growing. It's a lot. I don't think I have enough space for all of those, but I'm just gonna start planting things like all over the property and see what happens. Oh, I forgot one. Long Island cheese pumpkin. I have not grown this one before, but it's beautiful. And I heard it's pretty hardy, so we'll see. It's not hardy if it can't grow here. Okay, for summer squash, I don't have that many varieties. They're just so prolific. If, if you've ever known a gardener that grows squash and they just ring your doorbell, leave a basket of squash and then run away, it's really like that. They just keep putting out squash and you cannot keep up with it. So I, I'm not growing that many. But I am growing your standard yellow squash. And, oh, I am not growing a green zucchini. So I'm just growing a yellow, huh? I don't wanna be basic. There's so many squashes to grow. Why would you just grow a zucchini? You know what I mean? I'm also growing this tromboncino squash. I believe it's a vining variety. So. I'm pretty like 99% sure it's a vining variety and they're just like these huge they can grow like huge long squashes and I guess they they throw out a lot of them so I've seen some people use them as like chicken food which all of these all of these varieties can be used as chicken food which is great if you have excess I have the honey boat delicata delicata isn't as heat tolerant as I would like and it needs pretty rich soil. I didn't have a whole lot of luck with this last year. This is another delicata. But I'm gonna try them again. I like the squash, it's good. One that I had great, great luck with, it produced a lot for me before the squash bugs got to it, was this Ron Denise. And they're so cute. They're like palm-sized, just little single serving squashes. They're great. I highly recommend this Ron Denise to everyone. It tastes amazing. It's soft and buttery and just keeps producing forever. And now watermelons. This Desert King watermelon was one that I had good luck with. My mom also grew it last year and she had a good harvest. We even saved seeds from it. So I'll be growing this again. It says it's a drought resistant type and very popular in the watermelon growing areas of Arkansas. It grew well here. So this is a good desert variety that I found. This variety is new to me. I have not grown it before, but it was found in a clay pot in a cave in Southwest USA. So I'm hoping that means it can grow here in Southwest USA. <laughs> I don't know. We're gonna try it. And then the last one I have is a sugar baby watermelon. This is a very popular variety. I've had okay luck with it. It's not as heat tolerant as these other two varieties I just showed you guys. But I think that is it. That's, that's about it for the root sensitive plants that I'll be planting today. And I'm gonna be doing both in the soil blocks and a couple in pots. I just really hope my last frost isn't later than three weeks from now. Last year it came on April 12th. I have it in my calendar. But it's been really warm lately. It's not an issue of the days getting warm because our days have been up to 80 degrees this last week, but the nights will still freeze here on the property. And that's no bueno. But thank you guys for joining me on this little seed haul and explanation of root sensitive plants. I hope you join me in the next video when I attempt, attempt to make soil blocks for the first time.
hopefully not the last. Thank you guys. Until the next one.